The King's Rebuke, Matthew 18. Why do some of God's children have such a difficult time getting along with each other? A poem I heard states the problem perfectly. To live above with saints we love will certainly be glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. With so much division and uh, dissension among professing Christians these days, we desperately need what Matthew 18 has to teach. Jesus rebuked his disciples for their pride and, and desire for worldly greatness, and he taught them the three essentials for unity, harmony among God's people. In verses 1 through 14, someone has accurately defined humility as that grace that when you know you have it, you have lost it. It has well been said, true humility is not thinking meanly of oneself. It is simply not thinking of oneself at all. Verse 1, which one of us is the greatest was a repeated topic of discussion among the disciples. We find it mentioned often in the gospel records and recent events would have aggravated the problem, particularly with reference to Peter. After all, Peter had walked on water. He had been on the mountaintop of the Lord. He had even had his taxes paid by means of a miracle. <clears throat> the fact that Jesus had been sharing with the disciples the truth about his coming suffering and and his death did not affect them they were thinking only of themselves and what position they would have in his kingdom so absorbed were the disciples in this matter that they actually angered and argued with each other see luke 9 46. the selfish and disunity of god's people selfishness disunity of god's people is a scandal to the Christian faith. What causes these problems? It's pride, thinking ourselves more important than we really are. It was pride that led man into sin and in the beginning, Genesis 3 and 5. When Christians are living for themselves and they're not living for others, then there is bound to be conflict and division. Verses 2 through 6 and 10 through 14. <clears throat> the disciples waited breathlessly for Jesus to name the greatest man among them, but he bypassed them completely and called a little child into their midst. This child was the example of true greatness. True humility means knowing yourself, accepting yourself, and being yourself, your best self, to the glory of God. It means avoiding two extremes, thinking less of yourself than you ought to, as did Moses when uh, God called him, or thinking more of yourself than you ought to. The truly humble person does not deny the gifts of God or the gifts God has given him, but use them to the glory of God. An unspoiled child has, a char has the characteristics that make for humility, trust, dependence, the desire to make others happy, and absence of boasting or selfish desire to be greater than others. By nature, all of us are rebels who want to be celebrities instead of servants. It takes a great deal of teaching for us to learn the lessons of humility. The disciples wanted to know who was greatest in the kingdom, but Jesus warned them that apart from humility, they could not even enter the kingdom. They had to be converted. They had to, to be turned around in their thinking or they would never make it. It seems that Jesus uh, is in these verses, he's blending two concepts here, the human child as an example of humility and the child of God, no matter what his age might be. As Christians, we must not only accept the little children for Jesus' sake, but we must also receive all of God's children and seek to minister to them. Romans 14 and 1. It is a serious matter to cause a child to sin or to lead him astray. 
It's equally as serious to cause another believer to stumble because of our poor example. uh, True humility thinks of others, not of self. See Romans 14, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Jesus explained that we can have four different attitudes toward the children and consequently toward true humility. We can seek to become like the children in true humility as to the Lord, or we can only receive them because Jesus told us to. If we're not careful, we will cause them to stumble, it says in Matthew 18 and verse 6, and then end up despising them, Matthew 18, verse 10. It is a dangerous thing to look down on the children because God values them highly. When we welcome a child or a Christian believer, we welcome Christ, Matthew 18 and 5. The Father cares for them and the angels watch over them. Like the good shepherd, God seeks the lost and saves them, and we must not cause them to perish. If the shepherd goes after an adult sheep, how much more important is it that he protect the lambs? In these days of child neglect and child abuse, we need to take Christ's warning seriously. It is better to drown with a heavy millstone around one's neck than to abuse a child and face the judgment of God. Matthew 18, verse 6. And then verses 7 through 9. The truly humble person helps to build up others, not to tear them down. He's a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. Therefore, anything that makes me stumble must be removed from my life, for if it is not, I cause others to stumble. Jesus had uttered similar words in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 29 through 30. Or excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, 29 through 30. Paul used the eye, hand, and foot to illustrate the mutual dependence of members of the body of Christ. Humility begins with self-examination and it continues with self-denial. Jesus was not suggesting that we maim our bodies or for Uh, harming our physical bodies can never change the spiritual condition of our hearts. He was instructing us to perform spiritual surgery on ourselves, removing anything that causes us to stumble or that causes others to stumble. The humble person lives for Jesus first and others next. He puts himself last He is happy to deprive himself, even of good things. If it will make others happy, perhaps the best commentary on this is Philippians 2, verses 1 through 18. We don't always practice humility. There are times when deliberately or unconsciously we offend others and hurt them. Even the Old Testament law recognizes the sin of ignorance. And David prayed to be delivered from secret faults, meaning that faults that are even hidden from our own eyes. What should we do when another Christian has sinned against us or caused us to stumble? Our Lord gave several instructions. <coughs> Approach the person who sinned and speak with him alone. It is possible that he does not even realize what he has done. Or even if he did it deliberately, your own attitude of submission and love will help him to repent and apologize. Above all else, go to him with the idea of winning your brother, not winning an argument. It's possible to win the argument and lose your brother. So we must have a spirit of meekness and gentleness when we seek to restore a brother or a sister. We must not go about condemning the offender or spreading gossip. We must lovingly seek to help him in the same way we would want to help or want him to help us. 
if the situation were reversed. So the word restore in Galatians 6.1 is a Greek medical word that means to set a broken bone. Think of the patience and the tenderness that that requires. That's awesome. If the offender refuses to make things right, then we may feel free to share the burden with one or two dependable believers. <clears throat> we should share the facts as we see them and ask the brethren for their prayerful counsel. After all, it may be that we are wrong. If the brethren feel the cause is right, the, then together we can go to the offender and try once again to win him. Not only can these men assist in prayer and persuasion, but they can be witnesses to the church of the truth of the conversation. <clears throat> when sin is not dealt with, honestly, it helps, or excuse me, it always spreads. What was once a matter between two people has now grown into involving four or five people. No wonder Jesus and, and Paul both compared sin to leaven or yeast because leaven spreads. Remember, our goal is not the winning of the case, but the winning of the brother. The word gained in Matthew 18, 15 is used in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 22 to refer to winning the lost, but it is also important to win the saved. This is our Lord's second mention of the church. And here it has the meaning of local assembly of believers. Our Lord's disciples were raised in Jewish synagogue, so they were familiar with congregational discipline. What started as a private problem between two people is now out in the open for the whole church to see. Church discipline is neglected, a neglected ministry these days, it seems, yet it is taught here and in the epistles as well. <clears throat> Just as children in the home need discipline, so God's children in the, in the church need discipline. If by the time the matter comes to the whole church, the offender has not yet changed his mind and repented, then he must be disciplined. He cannot be treated as a spiritual brother, for he has forfeited that position. He can only be treated as one outside the church, not hated, but not held in close fellowship. Verses 18 through 20. It is important that the local assembly be at its best spiritually before it seeks to discipline a member. When a church disciplines a member, it is actually examining itself and disciplining itself. This is why our Lord added these words about authority, prayer, and fellowship. We cannot discipline others if we ourselves are not disciplined. Whatever we loose or permit in the assembly must first have been permitted by God. See the comments on Matthew 16, verse 9. The church must be under the authority of God's word. Church discipline does not refer to a group of Christian policemen throwing their weight around. Rather, it means God exercising his authority in and through a local body to restore one of his erring children. Not only must there be the authority of the word, but there must also be prayer. The word agree in the Greek gives us our English word symphony. The church must agree in prayer as it seeks to discipline the erring member. It's through prayer and it's through the word that we ascertain the will of the Father in the matter. Finally, there must be fellowship. The local church must be a worshiping community, recognizing the presence of the Lord in their midst. The Holy Spirit of God can convict both the offender and the church, and he can judge sin in the midst. See Acts chapter 5. There is a desperate need for honesty in the church today. Speaking truth in love is God's standard. Ephesians 4.15 If we practice love without truth, it is hypocrisy. 
But if we try to have truth without love, it may be brutality. Jesus always taught the truth in love. If the truth hurts, it's because faithful are the wounds of a friend. But keep in mind that humility must come before honesty. A proud Christian cannot speak the truth in love. He will use he will use a brother's faults as a weapon to fight with and not a tool to build with. The result will be only greater disharmony and disagreement. The first Internal problem of the New Testament church was dishonesty. See Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira tried to make the church members believe that they were more spiritual than they really were. <clears throat> they lied to themselves in thinking they could get away with the masquerade. They lied to their fellow Christians and the church leaders. And they, cry, and they tried to lie to the Holy Spirit. The result was judgment and death. God may not kill every hypocrite in the church today, but hypocrisy certainly helps to kill the church. The second internal problem in Acts 6, see Acts 6, had to do with people being neglected. The members and leaders faced the problem with truth and love, and the result was blessing. It takes both truth and love and both must be used with humility. Verses 21 through 35, when we start living in an atmosphere of humility and honesty, we must take some risks and expect some dangers. Unless humility and honesty result in forgiveness, relationships cannot be mended and strengthened. Peter recognized the risks involved and asked Jesus, how he should handle them in the future. But Peter made some serious mistakes. To begin with, he lacked humility himself. He was sure his brother would sin against him, but not he against his brother. Peter's second mistake was in asking for limits and measures. Where there is love, there can be no limitations. There can be no dimensions. See Ephesians three seventeen through 19. Peter thought he was showing great faith and love when he offered to forgive at least seven times. After all, the rabbis taught that three times was sufficient. Our Lord's reply was until 70 times seven, which would be 490 times. That must have startled Peter. Who could keep count for that many offenses? But that was exactly the point Jesus was making. Love keeps no record of wrongs. By the time we have forgiven a brother, that many times we are in the habit of forgiving. But Jesus was not advising careless or shallow forgiveness. Christian love is not blind. Philippians 1, 9 and 10, the forgiveness Christ requires is on the basis of the instructions. He gave in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. If a brother is guilty of a repeated sin, no doubt he would find strength and power to conquer that sin through the encouragement of his loving and forgiving brethren. If we condemn a brother, we bring out the worst in him. But if we create an atmosphere of love and forgiveness, we can help God bring out the best in him. The parable illustrates the power of forgiveness. It is important to note that this parable is not about salvation. For salvation is holy of grace and is unconditionally given. To make God's forgiveness a temporary thing is to violate the very truth of Scripture. The parable deals with forgiveness be between brothers, not between lost sinners and God. The emphasis in this chapter is on brother forgiving brother. The main character in this parable went through three stages in his experience of forgiveness. This man had been stealing funds from the king, verses 23 through 27, from the king, and when the books were audited, his crime was discovered. The total tax levy in Palestine was about 800 talents a year, 
So you can see how dishonest, dishonest this man was. In terms of today's buying power, this probably would be equivalent to over $10 million. But this man actually thought he could get out of the debt. He told the king that given enough time, he could pay it back. We detect two sins here, pride and lack of sincere repentance. The man was not ashamed because he stole the money. He was ashamed because he got caught. And he actually thought he was big enough to earn the money to repay the king's account. In the economy of that day, a man would have had to work 20 years to earn one talent. His case was hopeless, except for one thing. The king was a man of compassion. He assumed the loss and forgave the servant. This meant that the man was free and that he and his family would not be thrown into de a debtor's prison. The servant did not deserve this forgiveness. It was purely an act of love and mercy on the part of the master. Verses 28 through 30, the servant left the presence of the king and went and found a fellow servant who owed him 100 pence. The average worker earned one penny a day. So this debt was insignificant compared to what the servant had owed the king. Instead of sharing with his friend the joy of his own release, the servant mistreated his friend and demanded that he pay the debt. The debtor used the same approach as the servant. Have patience with me and I will pay all of it. But the unjust servant was unwilling to grant to others what he wanted others to grant to him. Maybe he had the legal right to throw the man in prison, but he did not have the moral right. He had been forgiven himself, should he not forgive his fellow servant. He, he and his family had been spared the shame and suffering of prison, should he not spare his friend. Verses 31 through 34, the king originally delivered him from prison, but the servant put himself back in. The servant exercised justice and cast his friend into prison. So you want to live by justice, asked the king, then you shall live, you shall have justice. Throw the wicked servant in prison and torment him. I will do to him as he has done to others. Now, there is no suggestion that the entire, entire family was sentenced. After all, it was the father who abused the other servant and ignored the king's kindness. The world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. If we refuse to forgive others, then we are only imprisoning ourselves and causing our own torment. Some of the most miserable people I have met in my ministry have been people who would not forgive others. They lived only to imagine ways to punish these people who had wronged them, but they were really only punishing themselves. What was wrong with this man? The same thing that is wrong with many professing Christians. They have received forgiveness, but they have not really experienced forgiveness deep in their hearts. So they are unable to share forgiveness with those who have wronged them. If we live only according to justice, always seeking to get what is ours, we will put ourselves into prison. But if we live in according, if we live according to forgiveness, sharing with others what God has shared with us, then we will enjoy freedom and joy. Peter asked for just a measuring for a just measuring rod. Jesus told him to practice forgiveness and forget the measuring rod. Our Lord's warning is serious. He did not say that God saves only those who forgive others. The theme of this parable is forgiveness between brothers, not salvation for lost sinners. Jesus warned us that God cannot forgive us if we do not have humble and and also repentant hearts 
We reveal the true condition of our hearts by the way that we treat others. When our hearts are humble and repentant, we will gladly forgive our brothers. But where there is pride and a desire for revenge, there can be no true repentance. And this means God cannot forgive. In other words, it is not enough to receive God's forgiveness or even the forgiveness of others. We must experience the forgiveness in our own hearts so that it humbles us and makes us gentle and forgiving toward others. The servant in the parable but did not have a deep experience of forgiveness and humility. He was simply glad to be off the hook. He had never really repented. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if anyone have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Colossians 3 verse 13. Amen.